Hi, I'm Mario Rodriguez at the Philadelphia Furniture Workshop where I teach. Uh, today I'm going to show you a pretty interesting way to carve a seat. Uh, I've been making Windsor chairs for, at this point, over 20 years, uh, utilizing for the most part traditional methods and, and tools. Here's a, an example of a chair that I made within the last year uh, that has a more traditionally saddled uh, seat. Uh, so. To make that chair, I started with a, a two-inch uh, thick blank of butternut. Uh, I've set the grain to run from side to side, and the major scooping and shaping of that seat was done with traditional tools like these here. Here we've got uh, a couple of inch shades and uh, and uh, uh, scorp, um, and this is a real tedious uh, technique. Uh, it requires uh, very careful work so you don't tear up the grain, uh, but you're also, uh, you have to pause periodically and evaluate your progress and sort of turn the thing upside down, inside out. Uh, it takes a lot of effort, it takes, uh, you have to develop an eye and sort of move, uh, move slowly. Once you remove that material, it's pretty much a done deal. Um, recently, well not, maybe not so recently, uh, about maybe 20 years ago, uh, somebody sent me a book uh, written by a guy named uh, Robert Marquise on making Windsor chairs. And uh, although I, at that point, had figured out the methods I wanted to use to build Windsor chairs, uh, I found the book sort of curious, a little bit interesting. I didn't think at the time there was anything in that book that I could incorporate into my own chair making. Uh, so I put the book away. I would say over the last couple of years, I've developed an interest in mid-century modern furniture, which uh, really is sort of mass-produced with a minimal amount of handwork. And I recalled this very interesting, very uh, innovative and daring method uh, that Marquise had illustrated in his book. And uh, I thought, well, let me pull that book out. Let's take a look at it and see if that might work for the chairs that I'm building today. Uh, so uh, here are a pair of examples of the chairs, and these are the results. Uh, now, um, now that you see what uh, is uh, uh, results from that technique, uh, the surprising part is that this chair seat starts out as a solid blank and is completely scooped out on the table saw. So today, um, what I'm going to do is uh, show you the various jigs and how they're set up, and then I'll actually demonstrate the technique. Here's an example of a, of a completed seat, and you can see that the scooping is fairly shallow. Actually, it doesn't go any deeper than a quarter inch, but it does have a nice pleasing curve around the backside, and the attractive uh, feature of it is that it has a clear uh, pommel that, that extends towards the back, and then the center areas, the, the seated the air areas here, are pretty smooth and, and flat. Um, the orientation of the, of the grain can run either across the seat like this one here, um, or front to back, like on this one. So it's really a matter of choice, but uh, sometimes the dimensions of the, of the proposed chair will dictate the direction of the grain on a particular project. Um, here is a, a completed chair with the seat in place, and it's sort of a mid-century design. Uh, so you've got something here that's pretty spare and clean, and that was my intention. Uh, to pare it down to its essence, come up with a chair that is strong, uh, capable of holding somebody of, of uh, size and weight, uh, and, and, uh, and still be comfortable. So uh, I'm going to set up the table saw to demonstrate this, this really easy and, uh, and unique uh, technique. Uh, first thing I want to do is remove the insert plate and the splitter. The splitter is going to likely get in the way and the insert plate is going to inhibit the removal of the sawdust that this cut's going to generate, and that's going to be considerable. So it doesn't go airborne, but it does spread itself around the table surface, uh, so it can be a little bit uh, uh, disconcerting. The jig uh, is a, it's, it's made up of three parts, and what I'm going to do is set up the, the base, and this sits right on top of the table, so with the blade, protruding uh, from that slot. The holes that are surrounding that slot are there, again, to, uh, to um, facilitate the evacuation of the accumulating dust and debris. I'm 
going to lower the blade. And I've got a pair of strips underneath to set the location of the jig against the front edge of the table saw. And I'm going to move the fence over. pretty much sets it up and then I'm going to clamp it on this one corner over here just so it doesn't move. So you've got the base in place, uh, the blade is sticking up, I'm going to lower that even more. Um, and then I've got these two bridges that are uh, that have pins. The, pin, the pins are projecting from these blocks and they're in line with the, with the center or the highest portion of that, of that blade that's sticking through. Um, over here I've got this bridge and the bridge uh, spans the entire jig. Um, it's got a series of holes from 1 to 10 um, and they, these holes are cut or drilled to fit over these uh, projecting pins. At the center is this, uh, is this uh, travel groove and this is going to control uh, or limit the, the length front to back of, the, of the, uh, the cut and at the very center I've got this pivot point here. So this will be set onto the pins. Um, it's set above the tabletop. The, the, the only uh, restriction that one would have is um, you, you have to be sure to provide enough room between the surface of the jig and the underside of the bridge. So uh, for instance here I've got about one and three quarter inches uh, so I'm limited to that dimension in terms of uh, seat blank thickness. So here I've got a blank that I've prepared. It's roughly I don't know, 16 inches or so wide by about 18 and a half inches long. Um, I'm restricted to a length that fits between the blade and this abutment over here. What I'm going to be cutting is a seat that will pretty much look like this one. So I'm going to be making that cut from front to back. That's how the grain's going to run. And I'm going to be cutting this, this silhouette. First thing I've got to do is take this blank and turn it over. Um, and I'm going to attach this, this follower. Um, and so this is basically just a piece of red oak and it's got a couple of handles. And the idea is that this block will be set uh, against the end of the block, will be set against the front end of the seat blank. And just, uh, just screwed uh, to it with inch and a half uh, screws. And that's the only thing you got to be careful of, not to use screws that are going to come through. There we go. So that's gone in maybe, I don't know, an inch, a uh, half inch in depth into the underside of the seat blank. So the next thing I'll be doing is setting the blank like so. So that traveler, um, that guide block, is fitting at one end of the of the, the travel slot or the travel groove. And what I've got is that blade is going to be sticking up uh, and I'm going to slowly move it across and then basically turn it, pivot and come back while the, 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 the jig is set on hole number one. So I've got the seat blank in place and the travel of block is uh, uh, set into the jig. Um, I've got the bridge set on, on hole number one right and left. Uh, I've got the blade set up for a very, very shallow cut, no more than an eighth of an inch. So I'm pretty much ready to go. So I've made the first pass and you might be able to make out a very, very shallow and very narrow 
U-turn uh, that I've cut into the top. Uh, that blade is set for no more than a sixteenth of an inch. And so I'm going to raise it a couple more times uh, while the, the bridge is still set on hole number one, both right and left. So this will just be a repeat. visible exactly what I was able to remove and let me check the depth I think I can raise that blade just a little bit more not by much it's almost a quarter inch deep right now so just one more adjustment on the depth so you can see that the groove is getting a little bit wider and that the pommel is clearly formed comes to a nice peak here and it extends back maybe almost halfway so at this point clear some of this debris leave it on hole number one on the left side and I'm going to advance it to hole number uh, number two on the right and repeat. just to show you the, the progression, how the seat is developing. But normally you can just continue. Uh, every time I move it forward, move the bridge forward, and uh, uh, moving to a, 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 a progressing from hole number three to four and five and so on, what's happening is that the seat scoop is getting a little bit longer, but uh, it will be getting noticeably wider. So every pass is going to widen the, uh, the seat.
So this is cut to a, a clean semicircle. I've got a tiny little bit of stuff here that I've got to remove. You can barely make out the saw marks. They're all nice and even. Uh, so minimal sanding will really clean this up. Uh, clearly I've got a little bit of room here. So I have options as far as how I want to shape the seat. Uh, I can uh, curve the front edge a tiny bit as I did on this one here. And also the back edge. On the completed chair, I actually followed with the outside contour uh, the, the, the shape of the scoop and that produced a kind of a, a, an attractive outline as well. So from here, I take it right over to the sander. Uh, I might start with 100 grit and uh, I'll be done in about 15 minutes.